it's very, so it's very inaccurate just to refer to a single nerve on its own. Although I mean, you, will, you may will hear me talking about specific nerves in each of them. Now look at this primal picture image. That was one of my very first pictures that I was working on when I was trying to study these, these blocks or describe them. You can see here a facial plane, both sides of the mythorax, right? And this facial plane, it has continuity from the inner part of the clavicle to the axilla, and is on top of this muscle here, the spectralis minor. There's another muscle here, the subclavius muscle. So what it means is that all this fascia, that is called clavipectoral fascia, that is sandwiches, the pectoralis minor, you don't see the lower uh, layer of it, it just continues laterally, fuses and becomes the axillary fascia. So you can see there's a plane above and a plane below that, and there's a continuity. So these are compartments. And this is the facial plane blocks, what they do, they're trying to put local anesthetic in these compartments. But keep in mind, there's no fully um, non-permeable compartment. So you will have leakage between the compartments. So it's semi-permeable, okay? So in these fossil planes, yeah, they lie or they sit several nerves, but also several arteries. There's a close relation, as you may well know, between arteries and nerves. And when I was studying um, scanning for the hemithorax a long time back, um, I came across one of the papers from the plastic surgeons and general surgeons that in, in those, in, in this specialty that is the, the thorax and the breast, in fact, they just overlap each other quite a lot. You could see here the neurovascular bundle in between the two pectoral muscles. And you can see here, there was a lateral and a pectoral nerve that we're referring to in a very schematic way. Uh, combined with an artery, that it was a acromiothoracic artery. And that was one of the first clues to just to put into perspective what this blog was about. But what is very important to me, and it should be very important to everyone, is that the hemithorax is complex and it's not only innervated by intercostal nerves. And those intercostal nerves were um, relying uh, on the thoracic epidurals yeah, to, be, to be blocked by them or the paravertebrals. The hemithorax, and at this level specifically, the brachial plexus has a lot to say. And this is why um, it could never be complete, any of those two blocks, to achieve full pain management of that part of the, uh, the, the thorax. As you can see here in this standard, you know, root trunks, divisions, and core um, expressing of what the brachial uh, plexus is, the spider, there are more than 1,000 different types of brachial plexus described is an enormous variability. Okay, you can see here the sonars nerves, they come out at different levels. Some of them, they come out at root level, like the dorsal scapular or the long thoracic nerve. Look how complex the long thoracic nerve could be because it emerges from C5, 6, 7, and D1. So it's a very complicated nerve to, to, to catch and to block if you are very proximal. And it's a very key nerve because it's the nerve that will innervate the serratus muscle. And it's a key element in the thorax. So if you keep moving to trunks and divisions, you can see the suprascapular, there's also a key nerve for pain management, for pain medicine. And you move a bit lower down to the core, you can see the lateral and medium pectoral nerves coming out, yes, here, from the lateral and the medial cords. Hmm? that are coming out from the root C5, C6, and C8, T1. If you just move down a bit more into the nerves, you've got the classical nerves. We have all the other all the nerves that are also very important, but we'll focus on just a few of them. So the PEC series was something like this. It was basically trying to block the hemithorax, obtain pain management in the hemithorax, and obtaining different images. We were moving from medial and proximal to lateral and distal, you could say that the PEX1 is more or less at the mid clavicular line towards the lateral third of the clavicle, but the PEX2 is in the anterior axillary line and the SPB or serratus plane block is in the posterior axillary line. At those three levels, you can see the sonogramming changes. 
So you need to be very familiar how they look like to, to accept what they can do. So with the PEX one or level one or one level, you can see that the local anesthetic has to go in between the, this muscle, this PEX minor, major and PEX minor. And you can see how it catches multiple branches of the spinal nerve, intercostal nerve, okay? And this is the sonogram I was showing you before. While the PEX2 is a two levels block that includes the PEX1 in between major and minor and one level down between minor and serratus. You can see here that the local anesthetic now, is just spreading posterior laterally into the axillary compartment to achieve something that the PEX1 could not achieve originally. That is to catch the lateral intercostal nerve. So it's a combined type of nerve that, or a dual nerve in which you want to cover the pectoral nerves on one side, plus the intercostals in one side, on the other side, plus a complete full group of nerves that arise from the brachial plexus. So this two in second injection is a key injection to achieve full blockage of the components of brachial plexus. With the serratus plane block, you can see it's the same really. You just delete the PEX1 after the picture and you got the PEX2 and the serratus plane block. The only difference, one was anterior axillary line, the other one is posterior axillary line, but the plane is the same. If you look at an anatomical dissection in which they use some dye, you can see the axillary cruise, and just by looking at it, it's not difficult to guess that by putting any local anesthetic or anything in there, it's gonna have some effect because it's a place, it's an area full of nerves that when you put dye, you really soak every single one of them. It's very big, so it's volume dependent. You can see here on the top, the intercostal brachial nerve, and here the lateral intercostal nerves. This one is not so dye. Yeah, it's quite low here. And also you can see the long thoracic nerve, the distal part of the long thoracic nerve, just very close to the uh, long thoracic artery. So it's a space, it's a very, very interesting space. And you can more or less, you can cover a huge area with the dye. If you move a little bit down, yeah, you can see here that it's go too low, Yes, you will catch these intercostals. This is MSA stands for the serratus anterior muscle. So under there, you can catch lower intercostals, yeah, but you will not catch the ciliary cruz with the top ones. You can see intercostal brachialis here. It's not dyed at all. So one of the issues with facile plane blocks, you need to know very well at, level, at which level you want it and what you want to achieve. If you look at this um, reconstruction, MRI reconstruction here, you can see how nicely yeah, you can guess the effect of these blocks over the hemithorax. You see here, grip two, grip three, grip four, five, and six. So the space between two or three is intercostal brachialis. Then you have three, four, five, and six. So you cover practically a big part of the hemithorax. You miss a bit on the top, but they can be sorted with something else. With the PEX2 and the picture we put for the description of this block, you can see how the gadolinium it covers the plane in the second level here and the first level here in between the two muscles. Also, and I want to show you this as an um, interesting point, you will say, and I want you to put some, um, stay focused on this, that you can see lots of white everywhere. You can see dot white here, here, even on the other side, even on the pleura, even into the epidural space, you can see a lot of white. And this is a fat suppression image. So this white, what it means is the vascular absorption of the gadolinium, that it happens very, very quick. So it's an artifact. It's an artifact you need to take into consideration whenever you want to see the truly spread of any local anesthetic or gadolinium into any image. So you can be full, you, can, you could say, oh, the gadolinium enters the interpural um, space, fine. Oh, or the gadolinium enters the epidural space, but no, these are artifacts. This is not real. Well, I mean, it's real, but should not 
You should not take it into account for your you know, decision making. Following these blocks, in less than two, three years, you know, everybody jumped into the boat and they started to describe different fascial planes. That is very low, uh, very interesting. And everybody started to describe and put names to lots of these blocks. And it, it got a little bit confusion. Luckily, not long ago, a few months back in Rapan, there has been um, a paper that's trying to put a little bit of sense to this amount of blocks. But in, in essence, what you can see here, three main groups of blocks, anterior blocks, anterolateral, and posterior. And you will see, like, for example, if you look into the posterior blocks here, you can see that how close the tip of these needles they are from each other. Yeah? So very, very close. When in fact, you look at the sonogram of those puncture sites, you can see that also the sonogram is very, very close. It really serves the sonoanatomy of the muscles. It's literally one centimeter up, one centimeter down. You can see the parasternal intercostals, the sternum here, and you compare it with transversus thoracic, the sternum here, and you can see, you see, same references. For these blocks, you share the reference, but you don't share the plane. In some of them, you even share the plane. So you can see here, parasternal intercostal, um, a bit more lateral sagittal paramedial, reaching now an image that is the costal cartilage, it happens the same with the thoracic medial, sharing the costal cartilage. You move more lateral, the same. If you look here and you go to the pex blocks, for example, that I did, you have more medial, the two muscles with the plane. The second image is just to show the pectoral branch of the acromiothoracic artery but the pegs never had the intention to change the name of anything. And just by moving a little bit lateral, what you're reaching is the axillary compartment. At the bottom, you can see the serratus that will be the block number four, more lateral, posterior axillary line. Here, you got different muscular reference, latissimus dorsi and serratus muscle. Here you go, posterior, same, same. Okay, so rhomboidal uses three muscular references, ESP uses three muscular references, and the same with the intercostal paraspinal, and the same with the retrolaminar. The only thing in the retrolaminar, and this one is that some of them, they change the bony reference. So benefits. The benefits so far well described for the PEX block papers are these ones. Hospital stay was reduced, recovery was reduced, nose and vomiting was reduced, sedation score were less, discharge was faster. And also there was a query about decrease of chronic pain at that stage. Increased patient satisfaction, decreased medication, and this implies saving cost. And can you imagine how important this is these days? So if you go and look at very, very old papers now from the considering when was described, in very fast, since the description, the pest block was starting to be used by some other people in different, different indications, not only for breast surgery. Like here, for cardiac resynchronization therapy, you know, they use the pex block. But funny enough, despite the goal, the standard was the thoracic epidural and the paravertebral. When it comes to very serious people, very sick people, that you're supposed to use the best, not the worst, the most reliable, not the less reliable. Funny enough, with somebody who was so sick, they chosen the block that was supposed to be the less reliable gold standard. And that worked very well for the PEX block because they gave them the most difficult cases and uh, it delivered, it delivered. Because in this case, somebody very sick with an NYHA 3-4, injection factor 20, the procedure was done on its own on the block, lasted three hours with no pain, no restlessness. So they gave him the most difficult situations and it did well. Other people did exactly the same. Look here, in critical aid patients, they use it for winning patients from the ventilator. How, can you imagine how important that is? And they noticed how physiological parameters were improved. And here they combine it, yeah, and they use it as an alternative, the combination of SPVs with PEX1 in very seriously, seriously ill patients. Because you can see when the technique starts, you know, 
people don't believe much in it. They just leave it as a final option, the last chance. And all of them, they use it as the final option. And when they saw it was working, you know, that's how people started to believe. Then was following by the use of pet block in any surgery, anterior shoulder surgery, because of the, obviously, the involvement of the lateral pectoral nerve in the shoulder, and you may well know. No, and very important, considering the huge volume of breast cancer we have in the world right now, considering the, the, the political issues and the medical uh, importance of this type of cancer, we had the postmastectomy pain syndrome. And this is very important for pain physicians. So important that it is considered that between 40 to 50% of all the women that they have some kind of chronic breast, uh, chron breast surgery will develop chronic pain in the chest, in the chest wall, on the area of the breast. I'll leave you here three papers. There are millions of them, or a lot of them, in which you can go through breast cancer statistics you can go through, through the incidence of this postmastectomy uh, post pain syndrome, or you can look at the epidemiology and the importance and relevance of this type of syndrome. Papers came through with this. So in pain practice in 2016, they already were considering the use of the PEX blocks for uh, treating this syndrome. And they found out that in a study with um, uh, eight patients here, they check the sensory function of the patient, the pain intensity of the patient, and they, re they realized that they, there was a positive effect up to seven days post block in all of this. So it's a recent block that very quick people started to work on it. And came, you see, 2016 again in Extra Europe, also Atma, that some of you may well not there in the UK, she also made her contribution into pain medicine with the use of PEX block um, in this case. She just presented three cases, very interestingly. Now everything looks very non-relevant, but it, believe me, in those years, it was very relevant because there was nothing else, nothing before that. So she presented three cases, a car mechanic and weightlifting, an ex-military and national level swimmer and a military chef, all of them working out on the chest a lot. The first one, multiple uh, admissions in a and &E for chest wall pain radiating to the left arm. Can you imagine? So obviously he was investigated on and on for cardiac pain. The second one, military swimmer, also with bilateral chest wall pain, treated before with costochondritis with no improvement. Every treatment she received, nothing worked. And the last one, another a chef that I don't know what he's lifting, but obviously he was lifting on something. Anterior chest wall pain that he was getting worse during lifting. You know, Maybe he was doing some military maneuvers or anything. All of them, after the combination of the PEX2 and the serratus plane block here, obtained either one other pain relief, fully discharged, or seven months pain relief, followed by pulse RF, or 90% for six months. So this is an extremely good result. In them. Also, you can see, we was followed by the use of PEX, uh, PEX blocks in chronic chest wall pain management. This time, Indian colleagues, they showed just a case reporting. It was showing 90 days of pain relief following this type of myofascial pain, effective. Another paper came in 19, so literally two years ago. So that tells you how recent this is in which they use PEX block associated with chronic pain after, after breast surgery. And if I show you here, okay, it was a prospective monocentric observational study with 140 patients. And they saw that the PEX block was having chronic pain with lower incidence of chronic pain up to three months in this case. So it's very recent. Followed by, on the same year, by another study in anesthesia. Now, some magazines that are more familiar to you. And this one, that is, maybe you, you, you want to take more into consideration. They allocated it to women in two groups, one for the PEX block, one for the SPB. And they noticed that the, the, there was an improvement in the chronic pain in the PEX block compared with the serrated Prince block. 33% 
against 10%. In the rates for pain free women, after all this, it was 25% against 48% in the favor of the PEX block. And in quality of life, a six block, a six months, it was equal in both of them. So the conclusion of this pay, uh, of this study in anesthesia was that uh, PEX block two, it was decreasing chronic pain up to six months. Yeah, six months after mastectomy, up to six months. So positive e is, uh, effect for sure. Even the BMJ came up with some studies, you know, uh, some paper uh, articles in which they were questioning if the pace block can reduce post-mastectomy pain syndrome based on all of this. And in this uh, study that it was cross-sectional, it was 145 patients um, in one group against 143 in the other group. And also they saw significantly reduced incidence of PMPS in the PEX group block. Other interesting indications that have been described for the PEX block is, for example, intractable postesperitic neuralgia. In here, again, case report, when everything failed, they tried this and they used it and they were using series of these blocks every four days until the patient got better with a positive effect. Something that it was refractory to neuroaxial blocks. You look at here to, to the SPB with multiple rib fractures and everything that follows those, you know, it's been very well proven, a very well studied for many groups, the in positive effect of the SPB in multiple refractions and different papers. This is even from Nottingham, uh, Queen's Medical Center, in which uh, with Nigel Bedford, in which they study and they attempted first paravertebral epidurals, they abandoned them because they could not move the patients around. They were in such a an agony that did not want to touch the patients. Then when they could not do that, that's when they try the SPV and the PEX and they find out there was an option, an alternative without too much of a problem, very simple. So posturacotomy pain was also presented in pain physician in 2015, okay? And, and here, what is happening is that the patient had a esophagectomy with esophagogastric anastomosis and the patient had an epidural. That epidural got blocked. Yeah? And in that situation, they question without trying to move the patient again, let's do an SPV and put a catheter and they obtain similar results and they publish it in Pain Physician. So another paper in Journal of Pain Research, the use of SPV for analgesia and traffic surgery. And here you can see even, even, and you know, it's a meta-analysis of the SPB for post of analgesia and breast and thoracic surgery. And the conclusions after 19 RCTs, that is something that is respected, is that it decreased the basis scores in those um, studies. You can see here in the meta-analysis how the sifting of the left hand, hand side, there is a positive effect in favor of SPB. Another interesting one in Rapan, yeah, in 2015 is when the um, Hironobu Yoshima, a good friend of mine, also was showing two cases in which um, after a clavicle fracture in, uh, in a man, 55 years old man, and after healing, you know, this guy could not abduct the shoulder, could not move it at all. So he did an SPV for four months and the patient had full recovery, full immediate effect on the adduction of the, nerve, of the muscle and full recover. Second case, diagnosed by an orthopedist, again, latissimal dorsal muscle contracture, again, for refractures, a, com a common side effect. Nothing worked. They did an SPV, and the immediate pain relief, immediate effect, and the functional and functionality of that shoulder. More studies of the SPV of herpes torsters, but now, this time by the emergency department. Look, 2020, the emergency doctors are getting very seriously interested in these blocks for people that are coming with Esper Sosters into the A&E department and they don't know what to do with them. And so they're doing serious or serious to explain blocks and how effective they were. Another emergency medicine magazine, also in 2020, no connection between the two of them are also claiming that they used SPVs in the emergency department 
for the same reason uh, is effective. Another group is of ejectomies and they did the same. So basically they confirm the effects from previous papers and in shoulder surgery, the same. Okay, in anesthesia. Now, to talk about the ESP, finally, this, the ESP, I want to mention something. This is not a very, I mean, there's a lot of work in this area for a long, long time. The only problem that you can go here all the way to 2006, 15 years ago, it was this guy, German guy, that he published it in, in, in German. So obviously did not catch the attention of anyone. And as soon as they saw the title in English, it was classified as like some kind of variation or a paravertebral block that could have some effect over the axilla. So probably people say, fine, no interesting. But in fact, what he was showing here, it was a technique at laminar level. Something that in 2016 was published as retrolaminar block, showing the GC efficacy and safety in this block. Same area. Yes, game for the Japanese. But if you look here, even before that, in 2015, in December, one French guy, a very interesting guy, described an intercostal paraspinal nerve block for thoracic surgery. And he did it in anesthesia, also UK magazine, something we are familiar, we all read. He did, this as, he did it as a letter. Yeah? So, but remember the PEX block was a letter at the beginning, so it can be equally effective. And if you look closely, this guy is a very interesting guy. You can see just, he does lots of funny things. He's an outside the box thinker for sure. And I, I found him very interesting. What he did, he put these two pictures, sonogram pictures, in which he's lifting the muscle, an A muscle, on top of the uh, transverse process in here. And even, even he did a dissection of the same place. And you can see erectrospinae being lifted here, and how is dissecting and looking what the dye is doing and what it's going to. So it was a lot of work. Now this guy completely lost the, I think he lost the race uh, because the ESP just took over the world like crazy. But uh, so I, I, I went into Facebook to find out what's going on with this man. And then you see in Facebook in 2019, how he's just working some kind of virtual reality to provide some kind of pleasant environment while he's performing his blogs. So you can see this guy is also not, is a bit of an outside the box thinker. Then October 16, the director of Spain blog came and it took the world like a storm, like a storm. And it was very interesting because it was applied to neuropathic pain very successfully. And you could see in the image how they would use the same principle, put dye on the spinae, and seeing here how affected the external intercostals, and also seeing here how it was affecting the dorsal ram, uh, rami or the, uh, the spinal nerves. You know? So they were doing the right things. And you can even they did a reconstruction, how that dye and mix of gadolinium was spreading nicely and very easy, like a free flow on the rectus spinae, but it was interesting for me to see with the sensory mapping for something that is claimed to be a paravertebral block effect, it was not really reaching the sternum. And I was very confused when I saw this. I said, you're selling the idea that the block is paravertebral, but you are showing me clearly that it's not reaching the anterior intercostal nerve. So I could not add up two plus two with this. I could see very well the whole of the posterior lateral part of the emitter was affected, and that is fine. And in this anterolateral part of the chest was also affected. Another image, not the same guy, a different patient. He was also, you can see, he's going one finger breath medial to the nipple. It's covering, interestingly, it's covering the lateral aspect of it, the lateral and the posterior, but not the axilla. Very weird. So then another paper came in anesthesia because the, the, the popularity of this blog was so huge that everybody started to work on it. Anesthesia published something in 2018 
comparing that retro laminar from the Japanese guy with the rector spinai playing from, from the Canadian guy, Forero. And he, they really methodically they dissect the, the planes because they share the same plane, but one is more lateral than the other one. And the conclusion is that there was limited spread to the paravertebral space. So how this block works. You look at the, if you look at the images here, you can see here on the left hand side ESP, right hand side retrolaminar. And you can see at muscular level, there's clear, clear spread of dye. But when you look, you, you, you dissect the thorax and you look from the front into the epidural space, you can see here that it's not really uh, filtration, infiltration into the epidural space or minor infiltration on this ESP against the retrolamina. So anatomical studies are confusing with their results. They're not human beings alive. So this brought the whole debate about how these blocks work. And there was lots of forwards and backwards letters sent into each other, bam, 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 to find out one, some of them trying to prove that the block was a paravertebral block Others saying no, it's not. So you can see here the group was saying the paravertebral lock was affected. They were making arrows in all these areas. Okay. But do you remember what I told you about the pegs to block and the artifacts? But you can see clearly here in this only slide, because you don't see the whole sequence, you don't know what is on the other, the only the, the, the let you see only one. What I see here is a very nice undoubt effect of the dye, of, sorry, of the gadolinium dorsal around all in the rectus muscle. So that's what I can see clearly in here. So funny cases, some people using for acute pancreatitis, the rectus maybe that will reflect some sort of paravertebral uh, diffusion of the local anesthetic. Again, posterocotomy pain syndrome, effective in case series. And now it came Hassan El Sarkawi, a good friend of mine from Cleveland, New Ohio. And he also wanted to find out exactly how this works and how effective it was. So he very methodically and in a very perfect way did dissections and performed ESP at T10 against QLs at L2. Yeah, so he did six calibers, six samples on ESP, three and three. Let's concentrate on the ESP, where well, this is the talk about today, is nothing to do with the rest. So 24 hour scan post, post that, he did a CT scan after that injection, and then he did a, a massive dissection from C6 to L5. He wanted to just leave it clear and for once, how was the effect of this block? He showed amazing uh, high definition pictures, of the methylene blue is spreading in the same plane as before. Rafa, we and can't hear you. Huh? Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, we can hear on the virtual side, sorry. Okay, that's great. Can I continue? Okay, I'll continue. So you can see here high definition image with the methylene blue spreading very nicely, freely at that level below the rectrospinine, something that is clear. In all of them, you can see the R, those are Rami affected. T10 was the point of the injection. It went up and it went down, but you can see like a stop here at T12 and something called LCL. That's the lumbocostal ligament, something that Hessen is obsessed with because he thinks it's a stop between thorax and abdomen for the spread of this local anesthetic uh, of this dye. On the QL on the right hand side, because he was comparing the two in this paper, interestingly, and it's not the matter of this talk today, you can see that there's also the same spread, but it reaches very low to the lumbar, low lumbars, all the way to your crest. And you know how important the low lumbar area is for pain medicine, medicine, pain medicine. Conclusions of his study only for the ESP. He showed in his study that there were 11.7 levels 
spread. So that's a very, very big spread. But he also showed that only in 50% of the cases, not the other 50, the spread was into the serratum plane. So what it means is the effect, if we're talking about local effect, it will be posterior, posterior lateral effect. Exactly the same that you saw in your sensory mapping, posterior lateral effect, 50% of the times. But it means, I guess, the other 50% did not reach the serratus plane, therefore it will be only posterior. Okay, because what you can see here, the block is spreading 80% of the cases up about the point of injection, and 40% is below the, the point of injection. So a nice spread up and down, but not 100% down because all that LCL. He also saw, interestingly, 83% 83% of the time it reached the retrolaminal, retrolaminal plane. So effectively, they're very, very, very close. 83% retrolaminar, ESP, ESP, retrolaminar, you know, same plane. Something to take home, 100% of the subcostal nerves were affected. So anything you're gonna do in pain medicine that affects subcostal, you have 100% success with this block. The lumbar nerves, forget about it. If you're thinking about the lumbar flexion, this is not the block because according to this paper, okay? Because 0% it was affected. That in a way is good because there's no motor block. It will not affect the, um, the standing of the patient. And here, look how interesting, very faint, very faint involvement of 50% of the cases in the paravertebral space. So it only just reached the paravertebral space in 50% of the situation. And if you combine with all the studies in paravertebral blocks, for the last 50 years, in which they don't really know what is the volume, the optimal volume for a paravertebral block to wear, but somebody tells you faint, and when you have 50 years of experience with paravertebrals, in which they keep increasing and increasing and increasing the volume, it makes you question if this is really a paravertebral effect. Maybe a tiny effect for that pancreas, uh, et cetera. And also very interesting, 50% involved four intercostal nerves. Yeah, but the other 50% involved zero or one. So it's like tossing a coin, the same. So either nothing or the maximum you can get is four levels. That of course it has effect, it's useful. So the conclusion is for me, this is an excellent block for back pain. It's an excellent flow block for muscle spasm you may have at any level, from cervical to thoracic to lumbar. So this is, this is true. So stressed everybody was with this block and the erratic and different information you were getting that even ASRA did a special article in the ASRA news uh, bulletin about this, in which they were saying curve your enthusiasm, electrospinal plane block, because it is easy, is not a really good reason to do it. And they were just going through all of these situations. In fact, it was followed, this was followed by the meta-analysis about the rectorspinae plane block in surgical, for surgical pain. And they also concluded there are moderate evidence that is an est a strategy for surgical pain, imagine for the rest. In the same bulletin from ASRA, you know, this paper from this guy from Florida, Mr. also was questioning, you know, leaning tower of PISA, avoiding a major neurological complication with the erector's plane block. What it meant in here is that he was questioning that by using this block, it was affecting the stability of the spine and how bad this could be in some patients. So debatable, uh, unquestionably effective to different levels but um, the final use of these blocks still we need a little bit more. So undeniable facial plane blocks in pain management, you will find huge number of, play, of blocks for this. The techniques, the facial plane techniques are widely spread worldwide. I mean, it's very difficult to find some people that don't use them. And uh, there's a huge amount of research on acute pain but it lacks a little bit on the chronic pain. It's something 
but it's still lacking. Thank you so much to all of you guys. I know it's very late. You've been working extremely hard. I like so much this workshop. It's been so interesting. Um, back to the floor, back to you. Thank you.